My message today is entitled, The Red Letters. You are gods. Really? My text is John 10, verses 22 to 40. There are times where Jesus says things in the Bible that are just plain confusing. This is one of those times. To be clear, there's something in this passage that I don't think I ever really understood. I know it came from Jesus, so that means it's right, because everything Jesus said was good and right and true. But I have to admit, on the surface, what he said just sounds wrong. The thing is, we're not there yet, but I'll give you a hint. It's part of my sermon title. But let's start at the beginning, John 10, 22. Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter. Now, I've heard more than one person say over the years that Hanukkah is never mentioned in the Bible. Those people are wrong. It's mentioned right here by another name, the Festival of Dedication. That's what this is. It's Hanukkah. No, Hanukkah is not the Jewish Christmas, as some people think, and they think that with somewhat good reason because it's celebrated at roughly the same time when Christians celebrate Christmas. And they give gifts, but the origins are much, much different, of course. The problem with Hanukkah is that it's not mentioned in the Old Testament, as the majority of Jewish festivals are. And there's a reason for that. See, Hanukkah has its origins in what Christians call the intertestamental period. This is the period of time, those 400 quote-unquote silent years between the Old and New Testaments. At the end of the Old Testament, the people are living in the Medo-Persian Empire. And Daniel prophesied of a time when the Medo-Persians would be conquered by another empire, which would be the Greeks. It was in the time represented by Daniel's vision of the ram and the unicorn goat in Daniel chapter 8. The ram with its two mighty horns represented the Medes and the Persians who came together to form the Medo-Persian Empire. The ram was defeated and destroyed by a goat with one large horn right in the middle of his head. I call him the unicorn goat. That represents the Greeks. That horn represents their greatest leader ever, Alexander the Great. At one point, that large horn was broken off. That was when Alexander died. And the horn was replaced by four smaller horns as the kingdom was split between four lesser rulers. Finally, out of one of those horns came a smaller horn as those kings were finally overtaken by one guy, a guy named Antiochus Epiphanes IV. Antiochus rose to power, especially over the land of Israel. And when he did, he banned Jewish worship, he desecrated the temple, and he tried to force the Jews to worship the Greek god Zeus. It was during this time that there was, no surprises here, a Jewish uprising called the Maccabean Revolt, led by a guy named Judas Maccabeus, or Judah the Hammer. He rose up against the Greeks, they recaptured the temple, they rededicated it, hence the name, the Festival of Dedication. One of the rules of the temple was that the lamp must be lit at all times. But after their battle, they only had enough oil to keep the lamp lit in the temple for one day. That oil miraculously lasted for eight days. And so they celebrate Hanukkah, the festival of lights, for eight days to commemorate this miracle of God. This was a celebration that was happening as Jesus once again has an encounter with the Pharisees. Verse 23. And Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Now let's get something straight. These people are not here. They're not asking if Jesus is the Messiah because they want to follow him. We'll see that in a moment. They're asking him to say he's the Messiah so they can use it against him. We'll see that in a moment too. But first, Jesus reminds us of what we talked about last week. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Do you see that? 
who Jesus is, is plain to the people who want to believe. The problem here is these people do not want to believe. They want a Messiah created in their image, a Messiah who will do things their way. He's giving them signs and wonders in abundance. A blind man could see that he was the Messiah based on all that he was doing. But the religious leaders chose to be blind. They refused to submit to the Messiah's authority so he could not be their shepherd, and they were not his sheep. All who follow the shepherd are his sheep. It was that way then, it's that way now. There are a lot of people in our world who want to say they're Christians, but they don't want to follow the Lord or submit to his word. Hear this. If a person doesn't follow the shepherd, they're not one of his sheep. And if they don't follow Jesus as he is expressed in his word, they're not a Christian. Am I talking about struggling with temptation? No. All of us get hit with that. I'm talking about expecting God to change himself and his word to accommodate our sinful desires. That's not how this works. We're created in his image. He's not created in ours. And if we try to create him in ours, understand that creation is not Jesus and it's not God. The sheep follow the shepherd. Christians follow Jesus. So what's the benefit of being one of the good shepherd sheep? Well, look at verse 28. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Please hear this. Am I saying once saved, always saved? <laughs> no. I'm not saying that, but to be clear, Jesus is right here. Jesus gives eternal life to those who belong to him and they will never perish and nothing can take them out of his hand because God is greater than all and no one and nothing can defeat him. So if we're in his hand, no one and nothing can take us out of his hand. But Dave, what if someone falls away or chooses to walk away? Look, it's just simple. Is the Bible ever wrong? No. Is Jesus ever wrong? No. Then no one and nothing can take us away from him. You say, but Dave, people fall away. Do they? Or did they never really belong to him to begin with? You say, but they believe there's a God. Good. The demons believe that too and they shudder. This is not about believing he existed or even that he exists. It's believing that he is God, that he is Savior, and he is Lord. And if he is Lord, then he is King. And if he is King, then he calls the shots and we submit to him and obey him. And if we get tempted and we fall to that temptation, we confess and we repent and we trust him for forgiveness. Because what we did is wrong we don't expect him to accept it he doesn't change so we must until we line up with him in all things or die trying i know this sounds harsh this morning but i never want anyone to sit under my teaching and miss out on salvation because i was trying to be gentle the best thing we can do is submit to the one who loves us most and trust him over everything else Otherwise, we end up like the Pharisees, looking great on the outside, but inside full of death. So Jesus right now is not making these people happy. Understand this. But if you think that upset them, wait till you see what happens next. Look at verse 30, where Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Now, this is the truth. If Jesus is the Messiah, then he's the Son of God, and the Father and the Son are one. They were asking Jesus to tell them whether or not he was the Messiah. And here in verse 30, that's exactly what he's doing. This is a line in the sand. Jesus is saying, I am the Messiah. Now what are you going to do? Are you going to follow me or are you going to oppose me? But understand, if you oppose me, you're opposing God. Guess what their choice was? Verse 31. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. 
I thought they wanted him to tell them he was the Messiah. But when he told them, they attempted once again to stone him. This time, though, he took them to task. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? You see what he's doing? He's directing their attention to the signs and wonders. He's saying, you asked if I was the Messiah. I told you the truth, and now you want to kill me. I've been demonstrating all over the region exactly who I am by signs and wonders, and you have turned a blind eye to every one of those signs. So which of the miracles of God that has been done through me is the one that justifies you stoning me and putting me to death? Here's their response. We're not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. There's the problem, right? On the surface, by the way, they're right. A mere man claiming to be God is blasphemy. If I stood up here and said, I am God. First of all, you should fire me. And if you're feeling really merciful, you should call the men in the little white coats. Because I need help. But there's a problem. I'm a mere man. I have given you no evidence to think anything else. If I claim to be God, you have no reason to believe it's true. But Jesus was healing the sick and raising the dead, doing miracle after miracle after miracle, one after the other. 37 at least by my count. He has, in fact, given much evidence as to who he is. But they were once again ignoring the evidence. They're willingly blind because they don't want to know the truth. And because they don't want to know the truth, they're going to miss out on something great. See, while it would be blasphemy for me to claim to be God, because Jesus, there, because of Jesus, excuse me, there is a related claim that you and I can make. And that brings us to one of the most confusing verses and passages in Scripture. John 10, 34. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I have said you are gods? So let's start there. Is this written in the Old Testament? The answer is yes. It's found in Psalm 82, verse 6. I said you are gods. So yes, in fact, the Bible does say that. The psalmist writes about people under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God himself, and says that these people, these human beings, are gods. Now, understand what Jesus is doing here. That word gods is in lower case. The letter G is in lower case. And it's also in quotes. The religious leaders wanted to stone Jesus for claiming to be God. They claimed that this was blasphemy because he said he and the Father are one. As proof of this claim, Jesus points to his miracles, which should have been hard to ignore. But the Pharisees chose to ignore them anyway. And so Jesus took them to their own tactic. The thing that they did so much, debating scripture. One of the sources I used to research this said this. Religious leaders and scribes of this era would often debate scripture using an endless barrage of technicalities and convoluted explanations. In meeting the Pharisees in their own method, Jesus was proving that even by their own standards, they were being hypocrites. He takes them to the Old Testament, the scriptures they actually accepted as factual. And he showed them a claim. How can it be blasphemy for him to say that he and the Father are one when God's word says that we are God's? Now, first, we should probably understand the context of Psalm 82. In that psalm, God is referring to the religious leaders at the time of Asaph, who was the writer of the psalm. And it's pretty clear that God is not happy with these religious leaders. He accuses them of defending the unjust and showing partiality to the wicked. Sounds like things haven't changed a lot 
with the religious leaders between the time of Asaph and the time of Jesus. God tells them what they should be doing instead of their misdeeds. Psalm 82, 3. Defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Even as he calls them gods, God is taking them to task and telling them that even though they hold positions of leadership, if they don't clean up their act, they're going to be in big trouble. And what Jesus is saying is if God was calling the religious leaders of Asaph's day gods, because they were recipients of God's will and God's revelation, even though he was highly upset with them, how could it be blasphemy for Jesus to call himself the Son of God? When not only was he following the Father perfectly, but his claims were being attested to by Scripture as well as by signs and wonders. Jesus was taking them to task here because he is the Son of God, and he was perfectly following the Father. Look at verses 35 and 36. If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be set aside, what about the one whom the Father set apart by his very, at his very own, as his very own, and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I said, I am God's son. Now, this is important. Am I saying we're all gods? No, and neither is Jesus. Nor is he saying that everyone who claims to be God is God. There's only one God in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. If you're not one of those, you're not God. Rather, he's pointing to the fact that he is doing the things of God. And he is doing the things the word said the Messiah would do. And because of that, they should at the very least be taking his claims seriously. Saying you're the Messiah. Saying you are God is blasphemy unless it's true. And in Jesus' case, it's true. But there's more. See, right after Psalm 86 says, you are God's, the psalmist says something else that is true. And something that Jesus will make true for all believers. You see, right after he says, you are God's, the psalmist says, you are all sons of the Most High. Friends, through Jesus, that is what we become. John 1, 12, 1, 12, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now, not only was it not blasphemy for Jesus to say he was the Son of God, it was the truth, and when he had accomplished all that he came to accomplish, he was going to lay down his life so that if you and I place our faith in him, we would receive the right to become children of God. And not just children, heirs of the kingdom, joint heirs with Jesus. Think about all that these Pharisees were rejecting here. No, we are not gods. And if we attempt to make gods of self, we will be in the most dangerous form of idolatry. But through Jesus, we become the children of God. We receive eternal life. We become part of the family of God. We get saved from our sins. And we become heirs of the kingdom of God. And if we, like those Pharisees, reject him, we reject our claim to all of that. That's what the Pharisees were doing. As much as Jesus is taking them to task, he's also pleading with them to have a change of heart. They're standing there self-condemned because they're rejecting the one and only Savior. And the results of that will be devastating for their souls. Look at verse 37. Jesus says, do not believe me unless I do the works of the Father. Jesus is asking them to look at the evidence. Look past your feelings about me to what I'm doing. Look at verse 38. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Jesus is acknowledging that they don't like him. They have a big problem with him. He's acknowledging their prejudices against him. And it's almost like he's saying, take me out of it. Just look at the miracles. He has just healed a man born blind. Well, that message was three weeks ago for us. 
For them, it was just a matter of hours, maybe a day, two at the most. But these people saw what he could do. Remember when John the Baptist was in prison near the end of his life? And he seemed to be shaken by the circumstances he was in. To the point where he sent some of his disciples, some of his students to Jesus to ask him, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? John was sort of asking, have I wasted my life? Or are you the one I was sent here to proclaim? See, I'd have to imagine John didn't expect that his work of proclaiming the Messiah would end up with him in a prison cell under an executioner's axe. But do you remember how Jesus answered the question? Because this is key. Matthew eleven four. 4, Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. The evidence of Jesus being the Messiah was seen in the miracles and in the proclamation of the good news. Jesus was on this day saying the same basic thing to the Pharisees. Knowing all the problems they had with him, they still should have been able to see what he was doing and the miracles that were happening all around him, even down to raising the dead. Jesus was saying, if you don't believe in me, at least believe what your own eyes tell you about me. Now, I might be prejudiced because I have read the Bible and because I really love Jesus. But I would think that would be enough. That even if I was unclear or even unsure about Jesus the man and his claims, that I would see what he was doing and believe. As a matter of fact, that's kind of what happened to me. One of the things that made me believe in Jesus was the miraculous change he was making in my life. When I first decided to trust him, long before I was thoroughly sold out, I took him at his word and he changed me. I started to believe and he sealed the deal. I believed, at least in part, because of what I had seen in others and myself. Along with a lot of other factors. I have to see at least part of it. Say at least part of it was seeing, was believing. Not so with the Pharisees. Look at verse 39. Again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. This is something we need to remember too. I've heard it said on more than one occasion, and I believe this to be true. You're immortal until your mission is accomplished. Now, of course, we don't know exactly what that mission is. We don't know how far we're supposed to carry that mission. But we see this with Jesus. How many times did the Pharisees try to seize him with intent of killing him? But he always managed to slip away. I believe that continued to happen until he was able to say from the cross, truthfully, it is finished. Remember, no one took Jesus' life from him. He laid it down of his own accord. He wasn't murdered. He was a willing sacrifice. He was a sacrifice with the power over life and death. He had the power to lay down his life and the authority to take it up again. And even when it looked like the Pharisees had their way, they played right into Jesus' hand and allowed him to do the very thing that would save all who believe. At the end of the chapter, there's a little epilogue, starting with verse 40. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. There he stayed. Jesus went back to where it all started less than three years ago. Back to where John began to prepare the way. Verse 41 starts off by telling us, and many people came to him. See, the Pharisees may have had their eyes set on his destruction, but it was not yet his time to die. Jesus was still here to seek and save this, that which was lost. And no doubt many people in that area had fond memories of John the Baptist. They said, though John never performed a sign, all that John said about this man was true. And verse 42 concludes it. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. John the Baptist prepared the way for Jesus. He prophesied about Jesus and Jesus fulfilled it. John was not here to do miracles. He was here to prepare the people to receive their miracle. The perfect son of God came to the earth to save a flawed and broken humanity. 
And then, when they saw the one John pointed to, many people believed. Today we live in a world where whether people know it or not, whether they believe it or not, and whether they want it or not, we are once again awaiting our coming king. And we in the church are here in the role of John the Baptist. Not many of us will do miracles, and even the ones who do will just be vessels that God worked through. But that's not what's most important. What's most important is that people will say of us that all we said about Jesus was true. We are here to prepare the way for Jesus' return because it is still Jesus' desire to seek and save that which was lost. No, we are not gods, but we are beloved children of God. May we be found faithful. Amen.